Welcome to another Maths Chat Live. It's your host Atul here. Uh, it's a nice uh, sunny sunny day here in uh, in London and the UK. So today we're um, just going to go for a quick round of introductions uh, with our fabulous uh, guest uh, in the panel here. Um, just a very quick uh, who you are, what do you do, and if you happen to have any yeah blogs, websites, or books you'd like to share. Um, so we can go with uh, Matilde first. Hello, I'm Milda Wilson. I work as uh, Vice Principal at the Archery Learning Trust in uh, Nottingham, and I'm currently working at Long Eaton School in Derbyshire. Long history of teaching maths. I have no books or uh, websites. Great. Over to you, Julia. Um, hello, I'm Julia Smith. Um, I'm a maths teacher, trainer, and author. Um, student textbooks, uh, Cambridge University Press, and Pearson, and, and piece, people like that. Currently working on BBC Bite Size Daily, which is brilliant. Um, and I um, tend to kind of work, I suppose, um, predominantly further education, GCSE, resit specialist. However, I straddle primary, secondary, and further education. Uh, so that's me. And Chris? Cheers. Yeah, um, my name is Chris Nagoon. Um, I'm a, currently in my second head of maths job, only started a couple of weeks ago. So that's been interesting given the current circumstances. Uh, sandwiched in between that, uh, I worked the market myself for about a year and a half. Um, got a lot of websites, startingpointsmaths.com, and I've got a book coming out uh, after the summer, hopefully, on task design, uh, which Mark is kind of co-editing doing stuff with as well so get that coming out great thanks chris um yeah just a very quick introduction myself uh, i'm at all uh, i'm an online tutor teacher at and science i've uh, been teaching online for a while uh no books or blogs to post well i do have a blog um, yeah over to you mark uh, i'm mark mccourt i run an organization called the cell and uh, we run lots of teacher events for math teachers, including, so quick plug, uh, including MathsConf, which is a very large national event. Uh, and on the 20th of June, coming up, our very first virtual MathsConf, uh, which is going to be bigger than any MathsConf ever. We had a thousand signups in the last 24 hours. Um, so it's going to be huge. We hope you can join us no matter where you are in the world. That's Saturday, the 20th of June. So yeah please do come along and join us. Uh, and as Chris says, hopefully a book from us in the in the coming coming weeks or coming months, eh? uh, depending on how long it takes us to finish it off. Uh, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, this is a completely unique thing we are doing. So this is, if you are tuned into Twitter or Facebook, uh, this is completely led by you. It's a Q&A. Just uh, use the hashtag MathChatLive or reply to this tweet with the video on and we'll uh, do our best to address your questions. Uh, so I usually like to kick off with a sort of specific uh, thing in maths itself, uh, the teaching of it, uh, something that is either bothering me or I've like looked it up, uh, seeing what the conversations are. Um, so this week I'd like to ask uh, the whole sort of bid mass, bod mass, in America they call it PAMDAS, uh, order of operations, and where I s I've seen it sort of manifest itself, um, or problems to do with that is something like using the cosine rule, which I saw something being posted on Twitter, and making basically finding the angle using the cosine rule and it seems to be some sort of bod mass bid mass thing going on that they learn early on and by the time you get to a level it so it's nearly doesn't exist and um, so uh, you know i've learned a little bit about it uh, whether from the field axioms and trying to like clarify that if you use the field axioms then there is no such thing as bod mass really controversially i put it out there so uh, yeah let's see let's see <laughs> Um, who wants to take that one first, yeah. I don't mind starting on that one. Um, when I worked as a maths hub lead a long time ago, uh, we did um, a lot of work with high teachers, as you'll know, and uh, they just didn't teach this at all, um, bid maths or bod maths, and they're quite confused that it, it's a thing. And uh, similarly, when I went to Japan on a impulse training, they we were looking at how children answer questions in different ways and how if you have a context to a question 
that automatically leads to how you should perform the calculation. So an example I'll give is, you know, the counting matchsticks problem. So say if you've got matchsticks that are arranged in squares, for example, and if you start with one on the left and keep adding on three um, matchsticks to make lots of squares join together, the way that you write that is one, add three lots of whatever. And so you know that you've got to, if you're writing that as one, add three times something, you know you have to multiply first because of, because of the context that it's been given in. So if you ha always have a context for your calculation, then it's obvious what the calculation needs to be and the order in which it needs to be calculated. However, if it's just a calculation on its own, that's where the problem appears. And calculations on their own are a bit odd to have anyway, aren't they? Without any context. I think that's, that's a, a really nice point, that that whole thing about context. Some, I, I think, uh, I wonder if some of you were involved in this thread, actually. Someone was talking about this recently on Twitter about, you know, people put the ones up that are deliberately meant to try and make you not able to do it. Right? They, they deliberately, it's going to be 49 or it's 8, the answer to this, depending on which way you do it. Uh, and someone was badgering me about that. Uh, and my response was, well, mathematicians don't do that. We're clear on what we mean. If we're, we're going to write something down and communicate it, we're clear on, like you're saying, so the, the, the context of it, the, the meaning behind it. Um, I always find it a bit odd that, that people will take these things out of context as though that's how mathematicians communicate. And we don't. We're very clear. We don't like ambiguity at all. Um, so yeah, that, that whole thing of understanding why the question, why the symbolism is written the way it is. What's the meaning of this? What am I trying to communicate? And if you look at it in, and it is in any way ambiguous, write some bloody context for it. <laughs> say, say what it's about. Uh, it, it's, it's not, it's not a thing that mathematicians do to try and trick people. We want people to understand exactly what it is I'm communicating exactly to find precisely the same thing that I, I would find if I did this calculation. So yeah, that uh, the context or direct communication of when I wrote this symbolism, I was thinking this, this, this is my intention in this symbolism. So there's no um, confusion there at all. I think that's an important thing to do. I think I'll, I'll come in there at all. I think, um, you know, a lot of these acronyms, um, I've had one this morning, you know, and they just they just add to misconceptions and and take people off into a, a, a different stratosphere where they're not reasoning at all. They're not developing their reasoning skills. They're relying on, uh, you know, bod mass, bid mass, whatever, uh, to help them solve it. But actually, it just leads to more and more uh, misconceptions. For me, any acronym like that just removes um, the reasoning ability. Sokotoa is a prime example. Um, SALT I had this morning, you know, it's raised an awful lot of issues, really. Just just talk about the maths and talk about the, the development of what's actually going on in front of you. Ooh, what's SALT? Julia. Oh, don't. <laughs> um, it's things to remember when you are uh, dealing with graphs, the fact you've got to think about the scale, the axes, I can't even remember what the L was for, um, and the T was the title. Well, you know, <laughs> they should be automatic. You should be automatically, if you're trying to draw a line graph or something, you should be automatically looking at the scale. Don't just check. It's all salt. I must salt it. It's the same with rucksack, isn't it? That isn't even spelt properly. Yeah. Um, when they're trying to just get them to check. And, and it's just madness, isn't it? I think anything like that just takes away the student's ability to reason. However, if I'm writing something, like trying to remember how to write necessary, I always have to say to myself, Myself, never eat cake, eat salad sandwiches and remain young. Now that's the same kind of process, but that's helping me spell, but I'm using a rhyme to help me. So it's, it's kind of one of the things that I'm interested in is accelerated learning techniques, of which necessary is one. But we had a lovely string this morning um, about why did they teach me the easy way to remember the, the name of the planets in order? Why not just remember the name of the planets in order? Um, 
And it's the same kind of thing that we apply to maths. For me, any acronyms, rack, sack, salt, big mass, bod mass, whatever, because it just leads to, is it big mass, is it bod mass, what's the I for, what is the O, you know? It just takes away the reasoning. That was great. It's like others. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. it yeah, we, we, we couldn't be bothered thinking about the thing for that. We'll just call it others. No, I love that. No, I, thought I, was, I thought I was of. No. <laughs> See, <laughs> See, we don't even know. There we go. Just, Nobody you know, knows. People, people make it up. And, and, and then when you look at that, something like Socrates, where you can't pronounce the H either, it, it's just madness, isn't it? And I had one student who was an art student at college, and he said, oh, no, I've got a better one than that. It's, and uh, it's a bit it's a bit rude. And I said, oh, go on. And he said, Colin always has sex on his taxi old airbed. And he'd drawn a picture of Colin on an airbed. <laughs> uh, but that's how we remembered the trigonometrical ratios. Just remember the trig ratios. <laughs> Don't have to turn it into a um, a whole picture or whatever. So, you know, I have a, I have an issue with some of these things. Yeah, I was going to come in on this as well. The, the whole idea of board mass or bid mass, to me, it's, again, it, it's devoid of any meaning. And I understand why people might use it. You, you want kids to remember stuff. But I think it's about the experiences you give kids to help them make sense and, mem and remember stuff at the same time. And like such a simple thing as uh, using some Cuisinaire, for instance, and getting kids to generate pictures and then to write mathematical expressions to to capture, well, what is that that you see there? Well, it's five over the fours plus a seven. And actually, it, it, it generically emerges from the activity on the resource. Um, and kids can kind of see for themselves, well, obviously we have to do the multiplication before we do the addition. And this, it's not, because it isn't, like Dave Hewitt talks about arbitrary and necessary, like the order of operations isn't some arbitrary construct which we've just decided is the case. It, it, it is part of math, so it means that kids can encounter this for themselves. Um, so I'd be very much an advocate of activities like that, where they're using different representations, to kind of get a sense of it for themselves because it is actually quite intuitive a lot of it and is i just echo what everyone else has said that the notation and what have you uh, there's no reason to have ambiguity like that um so yeah that's my topics on it another example that i've come across recently or i haven't come across recently it's come across a lot but i've addressed recently is the division and multiplication people thinking that the division comes before multiplication but they're actually at the same time and when we talk about things with uh, children in year seven or whatever if you're doing the area of a triangle is half base times height and the numbers are it's a non-calculator question and that they can do that in any order they don't have to times things together and then half it or you can the division and multiplication are interchangeable and they can do that in any order and some of the children didn't know that you know that they think that you have to do it in a certain way so there are certain times when actually it you know they, they think there's a rule where there isn't actually a rule so Obviously, we have to do it because there are questions on the GCSE that are specifically about bid mass. But um, other than that, I don't see how we need to do it, really. Well, great to see a lot of agreement on that one. Um, and yeah, there's just a really nice follow up uh, from uh, Una Kamiski on that one. Actually, it's just to do with the, uh, I'll just read it out. Should we expect students to use the term distributive, associative and commutative when explaining or is this just understanding the generalization enough? I rarely mention these words for fear of confusion. I'd say, oh. personally, I'd, I'd say don't be afraid of using the language of maths because that's how we become, uh, you know, there's a key statement, isn't there, now um, in the um, the department's um, phraseology is that, you know, it's about communicating mathematically. So we should be using the right words. Uh, whether or not they're assessed on it is a, is a different matter. But I think for, for us as educators, being using the correct vocabulary, as, a, as I said earlier to you, I was, I was very pleased um, to get the word vinculum in when talking about fractions it's not something that students need to necessarily learn but actually you know by pointing out the, the correct terminology the correct language um, I think it empowers students I think it makes them a bit a bit more curious perhaps you know to go home and say what oh, did did surge today I did advanced mensuration um, you know it just makes them feel a bit a uh, bit um, I don't know, a bit cleverer maybe and a bit more interested and, and maybe it develops their curiosity if we start to actually use uh, all of the correct terminology. I'd agree with that. I think 
use of correct terminology is really important. Our, our subject is beautiful. It deserves respect. It deserves to be communicated properly. And, you know, that it's a really important thing in mathematics to be both elegant and uh, eloquent in, in communication. And, yeah, you being able to say this is associative, that saves a lot of words. It saves a heck of a lot of words. And there's an elegance to that. Um, that type of communication. So, yeah, I'm quite, uh, I'm quite pernickety about these sorts of things. Uh, and I think correct mathematical terminologies is, is, it's just, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't accept someone writing a piece of prose or a piece of literature using grammar incorrectly. Uh, I don't know why we'd accept it in mathematics either. I think it also provides clarity for our students. Um, we had this whole argument, a similar argument with multiply and multiply when they were coming up through primary school and arriving, should we be teaching them? Well, actually, yes, because they know exactly what you mean. Yes, three times four and four times three give you the same answer. But when you have a multiplier, that's different. Actually, it's got the same answer, but again, the context may be different. And knowing what the multiplier is helps you when you come to generalize. And knowing what the multiplicand is helps you when you come to generalize. Um, so using the correct language, it makes it provides clarity for the students. And we're not having to say, oh, this one here or that one there. We're, we're very precise about what we're asking them to do. And I think that's really important for students who often get confused. People think that it's, um, it's making things too complicated, but actually it's not making it complicated. It's making it far easier. As you said, Mark, less words to explain something. It's far more efficient. I happened to be looking at a textbook yesterday from California, and the the rigorous and robust way that the, the explanations were laid out in it, it kind of um, comes to mind just now. For instance, they, they were talking about the, 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 a very small exercise, and it was this idea of the additive inverse and the multiplicative inverse those were those were two things which um they 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 just embraced that language and they straight up uh, were talking to the getting the kids to talk about that i think my connection is gone no we can hear you yeah we can hear you it's still there yeah um so so that language was there and they, they didn't make any qualms about that Whereas yesterday on Twitter, I shared an example, uh, also really uh, about negative numbers, and it was this kind of simple generalised rule that two negatives make a positive. And I think there's definitely a balance to be struck. It's between, okay, well, how rigorous and how academic do we want the language to be? But at the same time, we don't want, um, so we don't want to put kids off, but at the same time, um, we, we can't like hide from the essence of what the subject is about. And I think this, this fear of the axioms and coming at it from a rigorous perspective, um, I don't think it does kids any favours in the long term. Secondly, you know, even even words like sum, quotient, difference, product, these should be part of, of the, the vocabulary of children. They should have that very clear understanding of what these are telling them. It, sh it shouldn't be, um, like, how, how, like I see even in textbooks, um, do this division sum. Well, what, what does that mean? Um, so I just think that, that there has to, there has to be some clarity on um, language, definitely. Um, sometimes I do. I'll be honest. Maybe a wee bit different from some of you here. Sometimes I look on Twitter and there's lots of people talking about maths vocabulary, and I kind of feel as if are people just showing off a wee bit here. Um, I know all these fancy words um, because there's tons there's tons of maths vocabulary. Maybe maybe it's a weakness in both mathematics, but. I don't know how necessary some of the uh, some of the terms actually are. Um, I, I probably lean more towards kids having an appreciation of the of those um, of those relationships first um, of the of the distributive property, having it having a sense of that, and then building the language on top of it, um, rather than that this is distribution. And here's what's happening um, because I'm, I'm thinking about uh, across the whole. Um, of the correct one, not just way. Because it's easy to think about oh, this this t terminology if we're talking about pupils who are perhaps going to go and study maths at university. But thinking about more tenors, for instance, like the, 
everything is a challenge and it's then thinking, well, how, how, are we, how are we going to set this up for them? Um, are we doing them any favours by um, adding something else for them to have to consider? So, I think it goes beyond that as well, Chris. I think, you know, we should certainly be modelling that language, whether the expectation is that I think if a research student came out and said that's a community because of community properties, I think I'd fall off my chair. But I think we certainly should be modelling it. And I, I'll go back to the point that um, Matilda said about... Um, you know, the area of a triangle is base times height. Well, the area of a triangle is, is the process is, is base times height. But if you ask a student what's the area of a triangle, that's what they spout. They spout the process rather than an understanding of, of the terminology of what the area is. Um, it's the same with pi. I, I remember saying to a year six pupil, you know, what's pi? And, and he rattled it off to 20 decimal places. We called him Peter Pi after that. He had no concept of what pi was, but had his head had been filled with 20 decimal places of pi, not understanding at all, had no reasoning of what actually pi was and had never questioned it, just pi 3.141596 and off he went, which was amazing for, from the terms of the other kids, but he had no concept that it was a ratio of the circumference, the diameter, no, it was completely, you know, to my mind, it was a waste of his little brain, to be honest. <laughs> Brilliant. So, um, yeah, we've got loads of questions to get through, actually. So I'll um, kick it off with uh, another topic. Um, Erkan on Twitter is asking, I would love to know your opinion of mixed ability teaching in mathematics. And if there are any advocates, how best to make it work? Shall I start on this one? I think further education is um, post-16, uh, that's what we do with all day, every day. Um, that we have uh, students across the whole span, whether it's functional maths, whether it's GCSE, or whatever grade that they've come into college with, they're there to be plumbers, they're there to be hairdressers, it's not necessarily the thing they came to college to do. Um, and I think, to, to my mind, there's some fantastic resources out there now that help us. Um, and also, um, I think my training really helps Helped me uh, in the in the sense that um, I was I was lucky enough to be uh, taught in the time of Malcolm Swan and the Eight Effective Principles, and one of those is clever questioning. And to my mind, you can differentiate very well through questioning, asking very clever questions, simple questions, and then then um, expanding the questions out, open questions. But they have to be pre-considered before your. Uh, delivering the session um, and then we have things like goal-free problems which are amazing um, as a resource because you're taking away what's the answer uh, here's a problem find out what you can uh, and they're so accessible um, so accessible so we're, we're blessed with a number of great resources at the moment I'm just thinking of Graham uh, coming at Maths Emporium who's got gobbledygook questions uh, so he's taken the context completely away and turned the questions into gobbledygook so that anyone, you don't have to know what uh, any of the words mean, but can you, you know, what can you find out from, from the, uh, the numbers that are there or what a sense of what the numbers are. So I think we're blessed with a number of resources that will help us there. I'm going to start by saying I used to really uh, hate the idea of mixed ability teaching. It was something that I was never willing to try and was massively <laughs> against. Um, I did change my mind, uh, did a complete U-turn on this uh, when the new national curriculum came out in uh, 2014. Uh, and at primary schools, they were starting to teach um, away from mixed ability, uh, sorry, away from set of tables and so on. So. Um, being involved with the maths hub, I was part of the textbook trial uh, for Maths No Problem and a lot of our feeder schools were involved in this uh, and going to visit them and seeing children in year, years one and two all being taught together and then further up the school all being taught together was absolutely unbelievable. You talk to children and it would take you quite a while to figure out those who would have been in the bottom set or those who would have been at the bottom table. And I, I'd come out of some of those sessions with my colleagues and uh, I'd say, have you noticed that their reasoning, the reasoning of a five and six year old is better than the reasoning of some of our year 10 students in a top set? You know, and that, that was, you know, it's a, obviously a generalisation, but the way that the students approach their maths when they were able to work together as this whole class community with the diverse thoughts and processes that everybody brought to it 
So it, I started to think, actually, this could be possible. If it is possible at primary school, it's definitely possible at secondary school. Why are we having this cut off where all of a sudden we're going to say, you're OK at doing this and you're not? I needed a bit more convincing and uh, I went to some of the training for the Maths No Problem and Van Hart, the author of those books, absolutely incredible. If you haven't ever been to one of his three-day training sessions, I would definitely go. It's one of the best things I've ever been to in my life. It was stunning. And I came away from that thinking, actually, it's immoral to have setting in classes. And that it took three days of perhaps brainwashing by Van Hart. But I thought, oh my gosh, what are we doing to these children when we're not allowing them to work together in this way. Now, so it's all right being convinced yourself, but then trying to go away and convince other people to do that is another situation. And I would say it's not something you can do to a school or to your department unless you are willing to invest a lot of time in collaborative work and training. It's not something that a lot of people will be comfortable with or that a lot of people feel that they have the skills for, but they have. It's just a different way of thinking. And I was lucky enough at the time when I was working at George Spencer to have a department of people who were just so up for it. Uh, we worked together to produce the content. I think the content is really key to mixed ability teaching. Um, it has to build on uh, previous learning in a way that encourages students to link between things um, to help those who would be traditional bottom set children. Um, the content is really key. So we created a lot of our content together and we all delivered the same lessons and then evaluated the lessons and so on and it developed from there. And we'd all work together saying, well, that didn't work, that didn't work. Um, we need to ask more questions. Obviously, there were loads of problems when we first started. Um, huge backlash from parents for, of children who were in top sets, massive problems. We had a big open forum. I got shouted at a lot. Um, by children, uh, parents who didn't want their children in the same class as those naughty children. I didn't like to say that a lot of the naughtiest children are in the top sets, but you know they get away with it a lot better. Um, so convincing parents as well, we had to make sure that what we were delivering in class was really high quality and wouldn't hold back the top, uh, the top end of the classes. Um, talking about what you were saying, Julia, about um, not understanding a lot of the children would come to school and they say oh this is how i did it at primary school but why did you do it that way because that's what the teacher told us but why does that work and so we had to just change how we asked questions instead of saying what is the area of this it would be in how many ways can you find the area of this and then compare each other's answers uh, which one's the most efficient which is the most elegant way which is it find me a way that you wouldn't normally do lots of work on mini whiteboards comparing and contrasting, critiquing each other's work in a completely different way of asking questions and phrasing the questions. Um, so you never ask for an answer because lots of children just do the answer. I know how to do that. So um, one of Malcolm Swan's things that he always did was, um, and another, and another, give me an answer, and another one, and another one, and uh, trying to find as many multiple ways of solving the problem as possible. So I found it really exciting. I've been talking for a long time. I do apologise. I'll let someone else talk now. Chris, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I'll come in on that. Um, yeah, well, as you said, Mark, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle with this. Um, I have no gripe against mixed attainment at all. And um, effectively, all I want to see is effective excellent, vibrant learning and teaching where kids are valued, where they're being nurtured mathematically, where they're succeeding and where they're learning. And I think in Scotland, the situation is perhaps a little bit different uh, from England, but up here, particularly at secondary, the, the, you hear quite often of departments who are told by their senior management that they are going mixed attainment in August. Um, and that almost always doesn't work for the, the reasons that you, you laid out there, Matteo, that the, the department need to invest the time and the training and the professional knowledge and there's, it's got to be led by the head of the department. And it, all of that's got to be there. And I do know some schools in Scotland who are, who are using a, a mixed attainment approach to, to some extent uh, with good success. Um, the kind of the elephant in the room that I always kind of throw out here, and I, I'm, not, I'm not looking for an answer on this just now, is 
if mixed detainment is so effective, right? Because I, in my heart, I am a mixed detainment guy in my heart, but my head sometimes thinks I don't know so much. Um, if mixed detainment is so effective, because why then at the end of primary school is there such a big gap? Because all primary classes are mixed attainment. Now, how they are taught will vary dramatically. There will be teachers who use the sort of approaches of the good tasks, of get a well mapped, mapped curriculum, um, where the mixed attainment in the room is dealt with in a in a way where all pupils advance. But what what the overwhelming experience of pupils is in Scotland, at least, is they are in mixed attainment rooms. But I don't know how much teaching is mixed attainment because we see this massive gap that opens up by the end of primary school. Um, but I don't think it's a dichotomy here between rigid setting because setting as well, like you, you can see, you can see many, particularly in secondary schools, departments who have got rigid sets, set one down to set fifteen or whatever, and the curriculum might just be a list of textbook exercises, and it's completely unresponsive to the children. And the whole point of having setting. Is so that you can be responsive to the children more so that um, so you can see either of them um, either approach used well and either approach used really badly. Um, but I think it's important to be deliberate in what, what you do. Uh, I was talking to Lorinda Brown uh, a few months ago, and she she gave me a quote from a guy called Neville Bennett, and he he went round the, went round England in the seventies, and he said this: some of the very best teaching that he witnessed was in mixed attainment classrooms, but so was some of the very worst. And I think that would just be the same as in, in a set classrooms. There will be some teachers who teach setted classes excellently and others um, who don't. So what I'm getting at here is I don't think it's a dichotomy, but to be honest with you, I think my position on this is that of a mastery curriculum. Um, and that is where we are mixed to begin with and we ensure that everyone is successful and we move on together. Therefore, there isn't a gap that opens up. This need for setting shouldn't arise, but obviously it does. Um, that's the holy grail. How we get bloody complicated. And, um, so I'll put that out there for someone else to come in now. I think it's absolutely, you know, it's just a truism, right? That Mixability done well is great. Mixability done badly is not great. Setting done well is great. Setting done badly is not good. Uh, this, yeah, if you look at attainment outcomes at the end of school, there's, there's almost no difference between them when they're done well. Um, streaming is uh, just to throw something else in. Streaming is a bloody disaster in you know, all situations. Don't do streaming. Uh, but. Yeah, the difference between homogenized groups and not homogenized groups, there's, there's not much in it um, when done well. I wonder if we need to look quite carefully at the way in which we have populated the profession in the UK. Um, there is something about the size of the attainment gap Every single class that has more than one pupil in it is mixed. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how well you set them. If you've got more than one pupil, it's a mixed class. They'll have different learning rates. They'll have different needs. They'll under, they'll make sense of different things in different ways. Um, there is something about the attainment gap that's really important. I, I would imagine if you said to any maths educator, uh, would you find it most efficient, most effective, most impactful? to have a class that spans children who cannot yet uh, add together two numbers and other people who are learning second order differential equations would you think find that an efficient classroom and most people would say no it wouldn't be a, an efficient classroom um, so there is something about the size of the attainment gap. The attainment gap clearly gets to the point where it's not an efficient thing to do. And partly that is because when, as the attainment gap grows and the children that are in front of you, so people have heard me talk about mixed attainment before, know I very often talk about game, which I think is one of the best examples 
of mixed that I've ever seen. Uh, where you have a task and then people are accessing it at different levels, all stuff we know about. Um, but there's something about the size of this attainment gap where it is then incumbent upon the teacher, it's a burden upon the teacher to have up their sleeves many, 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 many more pedagogic choices, um, ways of responding, ways of communicating mathematically, many more than if the attainment gap is small. Which is fine if you are a maths educator with expertise in the entire range. But that's exceedingly rare, exceedingly rare to find that. Um, so we need to look at the makeup of the staff who are delivering the courses to work out whether or not this can be achieved and how big that gap is. On average, the gap at age 11 is about seven years worth of learning in, a, in a, an average English secondary school, about seven year gap. Um, that's a lot. And most secondary schools know this. Most secondary school know no 11 year olds who can't number one to 10, no 11 year olds who can do pretty interesting mathematics, algebra and mathematical thinking. Um, where is it that the gap gets such that your expertise runs out and the number of pedagogic choices and the number of decisions you need to make in, a, in any given activity um, is too much. And I think that's a really important thing to do, that where you see systems with it working extremely well, um, it might be that the department or the maths team are highly expert across the whole range of mathematics. Or you might be in a jurisdiction where a primary teacher is expected to have a master's degree um, qualification in education. Or you might be in a jurisdiction where you're expected to spend at least 10 years training to become a maths teacher. You know, so there, there, there are massive differences to where these things uh, take place. But as Chris was saying, either can be done really well, either can be done really badly. Um, I just think you need to understand the challenges that you face if you're going to tackle an enormous attainment gap in a single room, which is why, you know, as Julia was saying, um, some of the people that face the toughest challenge are, and, and anyone who t teaches in the few hundred FE colleges will know this, when they arrive in, in September, bearing in mind they've also just been told, for a lot of them, they've just been told, you're a failure. I, I know, you know this, maybe they got a low grade and it's not a fail, but that's what they've heard, that we're a failure. So you, you're faced with this a group, and they're sometimes very large groups as well, you're faced with large groups with enormous attainment gap huge, huge attainment gap. That attainment gap can be 10, 11 years. You know, there can be, there can be, it's not unusual to meet uh, GCSE reset classes and FE, where again, people will struggle with basic arithmetic. And someone else, they kind of just flunked GCSE, but mathematically, they weren't that far off. That's an enormous gap. And is, is a 10 year gap an appropriate place to use that model? If you don't have a choice, right? They kind of got to use that model. Oh, we do have uh, a choice. Um, you know, they can they can deliver it how they wish to deliver it. And and one of the things they've been involved in is the Five Rs project, which takes a completely different view, a different stance for, for FE, thinking about, well, you've seen it all. You've seen everything you need to know, just you can't do it all yet. And that might be for one person uh, being able to uh, add and subtract fractions. And yet for another, they might have some misconceptions with um, Pythagoras or trigonometry. Uh, but it's finding each person's starting point. So it's about individual learning for FE students, but also recognising that they've seen absolutely, they've seen enough so that if we just sort out what they sort of know and make the stuff that they do know really, really good, that's enough. They don't need anything new. Um, it's all about revision. Turn that whole year of a reset, which isn't a year, it's 30 weeks if you're lucky, and they're probably not there for a third of it. So you've got about 20 weeks um some classes that i've seen have got 45 kids in well they don't have 45 kids in because they're not always there um so you've got major major issues going on there however if you turn it on its head and and, and tell a, a student right it's not going to look or feel or sound like school we're going to do things very very differently but you've got a part to play in this as well you have to do some daily maths and we'll sort out the basics and we'll make what you know really really good so that you know it superbly 
um, and then we'll just plug the sort the misconceptions out. Then you can you can jump from a grade three to a grade five, and we've seen some students doing that. I just yeah. want to, to address what you said, Mark, about um, the ten year gap. But um, obviously, it'd be less if it was a year seven child, for example. Those children who can't do their number bonds to ten would also be out of their depth in a bottom of step. Um, so those children, you know, they're always going to need some catch up and the catch up funding, how you use that in your school is really important and really key. And that should actually be set, completely separate to your maths lessons because you don't only learn about calculation in your maths lessons, as we all know, we've talked about that already. Um, reasoning and problem solving, which is two thirds of what we're supposed to be teaching, is often the same across the board, top set to bottom set, the reasoning and problem solving skills of the students is very mixed in each of the classes. And actually, if you take out students who are who struggle with calculation and so on and just concentrate on that in math lessons, they're not going to have the opportunity to, to develop their reasoning and problem solving skills with a community that they're, in, like, they're likely to um, encounter outside school. So in a mixed attainment class, you will have people who are very articulate when they're speaking. You'll have people who, have, uh, who are very creative with their ideas. And that, that doesn't necessarily belong to people who are in a top set or in a bottom set. They are spread out throughout um, the classes. So in a mixed attainment class, children will have experience of all these different types of ideas, different types of thought. They'll have their idea ears modeled to them they'll be able to see how other people attempt work. And also those who are at the top end will have the opportunity to try things in lots of different ways if you are um, teach, specifically teaching reasoning and problem solving. And I think the shift to the more explicit teaching of reasoning and problem solving across the board, I know lots of teachers have been doing that forever, but the more generalized teaching of that how it does lend itself to mixed attainment classroom and it does bring on those skills in students who might never have experienced that if they are constantly only concentrating on numeracy which we know is only a subset of the entire part of what we teach in that. Suppose we took the um, you know that every, every secondary school uh, and I certainly know that you know this Matilda because I've visited your schools and schools I've worked in um, would have been very similar. Uh, every single secondary school has 11 year olds. It might just be one, two or three, right? Out of 200. But there are definitely always some 11 year olds who say can't number one to 10 or can't add two single digit numbers or something like that. Um, now, some of those might be because they have severe learning difficulties. And let's, let's for a moment park those children, right? Because there's, there's, there's something they need very, very, very. Um, specialized support but let's say they're not in that group that you have an 11 year old who is not cognitively impaired uh, but they can't number one to ten why is it they can't number one to ten how could they have spent six years in the mathematics education and not be able to number one to ten what, what do we think about that because uh, you know I would I would suggest that there is something about the fact that the continuity of their curriculum was not taken seriously, that they were dragged along on some curriculum designed for someone else, designed for some other child, and weren't able to grip fundamental ideas in mathematics. And then it's really, really hard to grip fundamental ideas later on. So I'd be really interested in why, why we think those 11-year-olds exist, why we think there is a seven-year attainment gap in England, yet there is not a seven-year attainment gap in Singapore. It, it, not, by, you know, not by a long shot. Um, why is that the case here? The, um, Sorry. Per personal experience of those students, if they, like you said, Mark, the majority of students in that situation have a very specific learning difficulty and a need. Um, and if you say if, if they don't have that, then the, what's usually happened is some kind of neglect in the primary school or at home. When I say neglect in the primary school, 
we we often had children at my last school where they would turn up and they hadn't actually been in full-time education but we didn't know that so they'd when we say they hadn't been in full-time education they hadn't been in the classroom full-time they'd often been taken out because they were so weak they felt like they weren't able to access the curriculum so they were taken out for one-to-one now that obviously didn't work so there's th- those children there's also those who uh, didn't attend school there's those who have horrendous lives at home and have completely other things going on in their life where learning isn't their biggest priority but survival is so there's lots of different things going on there and um, if you don't have a learning difficulty that's very specific there's no reason why you can't then pick that up over time with the experience you know over with the experience that we've had I don't know if that's the same for everybody else, if you found that, but those children who have been behind can catch up if there isn't a specific learning difficulty. I'm going to come in on that point because um, I was always struck by uh, one of my heroes, uh, William Emony, and his spiral curriculum, uh, where he's got these fantastic posters on great maths teaching ideas, and they kind of just show you, and I know, Mark, you've got something very, very similar with that beautiful curriculum, where everything every topic comes back down to adding up taking away multiplying dividing and the bigger uh, the nodes are in the middle of the curriculum um links to absolutely everything and i think it's uh, the skill of a maths teacher to link everything back to the basics as much as we can for for example it annoys me intensely about exact trig ratios that it's just something that student learn, students learn and then they've got the hand thing where they can remember the one, two, three, four and then the four, three, two, one. And, you know, it's bonkers. Just build it from equilateral triangles and a, and a right angle isosceles triangle. And it's about building and, and linking back to things uh, and building that reasoning and, 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 and making those connections between square numbers and a square. Who knew? Um, you know, there's that, there's that, that, that's the skill of the teacher to make those connections back to the four basics, you know, the nine nine basics of, of number, which I think you've referred to in the past, um, your numerosity ideas, Mark, which really kind of uh, struck a chord with me. Uh, get the nine basics right, um, including fractions, decimals and percentages. And I've seen there was a question on that. Um, then, you know, recognising they're all the same thing um, just makes it a bit more sort of um, real, I suppose. But if you're never in a classroom, you're not going to have that, are you? You know the children who are taken out by a TA, and no disrespect to the TAs because they'll be doing a great job with them. But if they're not a math specialist who knows about all the links, who knows that the square numbers are linked to squares, you know, how are those links made? So children who are taken out, out of the big classroom where they experience all those links, even if they don't make the connection straight away, like you said, Julia, they're there all the time. Every single lesson, a maths teacher is always going to be linking back to a previous lesson or to a previous thing. And actually, everything you do, you use skills that you've built up over time. And completely revisiting those skills is going to help embed those. But if you're taken out and you miss a lesson, um, that could, you know, that stops those links being made straight away. And it makes it very difficult for people to build those connections up. I'm going to... I'm going to suggest, throw something in the pot. Uh, I'm going to suggest that the very hardest mathematics to teach is the earliest mathematics, but by a long way. Um, and that teaching early mathematics and getting people to develop mathematically in those, in those early ideas requires real real dedicated expertise doing that and I'm not sure that that's what we have and one of the things that I meet a lot as I work with schools around the country and one of the things secondary schools often say um, is that they have so they have these cohorts of children that are stuck with early years mathematics but they were never trained the teachers themselves we're never trained on how to teach early years mathematics. So they don't know the models, metaphors, examples. They don't know the explanations, the connections, the way of communicating them. And then, of course, you get this curse of, of yourself never having to have thought about it for years and years and years. You know, most, most secondary school teachers haven't had to think about 
the fiveness of five, what that means. They haven't had to think about that for, for decades. And no one's asked them to think about how do I get someone who doesn't know this to get a grip of it. So I think there's something there about um, uh, uh, developmentally early mathematics being extraordinarily difficult to teach. And we haven't dedicated enough training in the system to make sure that those people who meet pupils with early developmental mathematical problems in ways of how to communicate these ideas, how to get a child to grip these ideas and, and understand them. So, and that's not where you, where you see jurisdictions where the, the attainment gap is not enormous. And there are many jurisdictions where the attainment gap is not seven years at age 11. That is very often the characteristic they have, that there's a lot of dedicated training of teachers on how to communicate early developmental ideas. Um, and we seem to have thrown that away. Uh, it's funny, you know, but it's, it's only 10 years ago that every school in the country had a book telling them about all this stuff. It wasn't the best book in the world, The National Strategies, but it did tell you the whole thing, right? It told you, it told you the whole domain. Um, and you, you mentioned earlier about some textbooks, actually, uh, where they've been really, really, really carefully thought about in the way in which they progress. And really carefully thought about in the models and so on. Um, it always strikes me as odd that we don't provide every maths teacher in the country, at least with the whole domain and five or six models for communicating the whole domain. It seems like a, an unusual thing. I was going to bring up the textbooks when you were just talking about that, Mark, because as I said, that maths no problem training, I'm not advertising their books because it's one of a few, but it's the one that I'm most aware of. Um, they. The, the way that they train for that is amazing. So the the book itself is no good without the training, and they often talk about that, the people who provide the books. So they're like, don't buy the books and think that that's going to fix everything. You have to have the training behind it. And this is what we were saying about the mixed attainment as well. Without the training, it's very difficult to implement these things, so you have to dedicate your time to that. Now, when I uh, organised some of that training for uh, the East Midlands region, uh, some schools closed their school for the day so that all of the teachers could come and receive the training. And I was thinking, what dedication that is. They're going to have great maths education in their school because everybody will have had the proper training, uh, not just disseminated and learnt third or fourth hand. Um, similarly, in Japan, they have their textbooks all the way through and you can see them from one year to the next, what leads in to each one. And in the textbook for when you're eight years old, it refers back to activities that you did when you were four years old and five years old and six years old and so they're always referring back to examples that have been used in the past now if you're only teaching one year group and you don't have experience of all those other years how do you know what to say um that your lead your maths is leading into how can you say what they should have learned before if you've only got experience of one year group so when you have whole school training uh, and everybody's looking at what everybody else is doing and a coherent curriculum all the way through. I agree with you, Mark, that's something that's hugely missing in our country um, and people are addressing it now, but over time I think that's been a huge problem and has been a cause of a lot of the gaps in the education. And I, from what I experience with primary schools over the last five or six years, this is infinitely better than it has been in the past for a while, but since the strategist was there. There's a gap between the strategies and the new curriculum where we had a bit of a problem, didn't we, with things not being so coherent between the groups. Well, we, we blew up the entire system. Right? <laughs> we, we had something that, was, that had problems, but it was entirely coherent. It did have problems, but it was coherent. And then we said, uh, let's just throw that away and ask 18,000 schools to come up with their own solution without any help. And it's taken a decade to start bringing that around. Um, and it's interesting the, um, where you see the pockets of people that have engaged in training. They're very, very different. You know, so like the stuff you guys used to do in the East Midlands, you can see really good examples of how that's then spun out. And, uh, there's a strange attitudinal thing now that has emerged in the last 10 years because people became not used to it, 
Um, so like when people join Complete Maths and we say, like, so you've got to take the training. Quite a lot of people say to us, I don't want to do that, I just want to buy it. And we say, well, you can't. You, you have to you have to come on this training. And they, people get really confused by it. They get confused by saying, because they're saying, no, I just want to buy a thing from you. And you see that happening you know, in, in other jurisdictions where publishers won't sell textbook ranges because they realize <coughs> that their textbook won't be impactful without the training. And it's the training that matters. Um, we, we had a, a, a report recently at the start of uh, January, February, I think it was, looking at ed tech. Um, for every one pound spent on software and technology, four pence is spent on training. That's, that's just nuts. It should be the other way around. It should be completely the other way around. Um, but people are, are putting all their resource into the, the, the technology or the software or the book and none of the resource into, so what does this mean for us pedagogically and what other decisions do we have to make? So, yeah, it's strange. It's a strange decision. Well, I've got another question that I suppose is linked to mixed ability teaching, um, which is the one about differentiation that came up. Um, and it's, it's a fairly long one, but I'll try and summarize it by... So when I first trained, there was, popul there was a popularity of having three leveled worksheets, all, most, some type of approach. And that seems to have changed over the years. My question is really, what does effective differentiation look like and how can I move students from being able to do the maths and get the correct answer from a process to really having a depth of understanding? Chris, do you want to jump in on this and maybe pick up some... I think you are about to say something on the other one as well. Yeah, well... With that, it, it's... I, th I think on what this is rooted in what, in what you perceive maths to be as a subject yourself. Like what, what, what is mathematics? What is it you, you want kids to actually be able to to do, to think, and um, talking about talking about their their sense of self as a mathematician as well. Um, I categorically would never put up um, all some few kind of. Uh, tasks in class because if I'm teaching it, an expectation is that I'm going to hopefully set up a, a situation where every pupil should be able to get there. Um, having said that, like, my experience, at least over the past five years, has been in a mastery context. So that is homogenous groupings where um, kids are broadly at the same level, although there's often a range there, um, and you're, you're trying to move them along. Um, so the the, the aspects to this for me that, that come out of focus here, pedagogy is important, of course, as pedagogy is always important. Um, having a range of strategies and questioning, formative assessment, and so on on the go there, but it's not the whole story. And I think we sometimes get too caught up in in the pedagogy. The other the other thing we need to look at again is the actual mathematics as well. Um, so we've already talked about the axioms. Uh, Mark and I have many conversations about the idea of didactics. We're talking about how, how do we transform the mathematics from the academic subject into something which we're conveying to the kids? What about these unifying models that permeate the entire subject? Uh, for instance, what do we mean by the, the word unity? What, what is unitness? Uh, how does that permeate the, the subject? What, what are we getting at there? So you've got that kind of side of it, and these are two considerations that we need to have as teachers and always be thinking about. But on top of that, again, we've got to be thinking about, well, what Oh, have we lost Chris? I think we've lost his audio stream, yeah. <laughs> I know, disaster. <laughs> That's fine, I'll message him in the background and get him back up. Uh... Oh no, he's back, I think. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I yeah just... I heard. We lost the last minute or so, if you can just repeat that. And what I'll do, is I'll just mute your video so the bandwidth is better yeah, while, you're, while you're talking, yeah. Um, right, okay, um, so I was kind of saying, so pedagogy is obviously important. Um, we need to also think about the actual mathematics itself, but 
um, and I'm looking at the key here and throughout the, throughout the curriculum, um, one of the things I was going to pick up on a moment ago is in, in South Korea, for instance, uh, when, when teachers are teaching, you need to know the, the learning traje uh, trajectories that pupils are on. So that is the horizontal and vertical ones. So for instance, how does this topic, how does it relate to other topics that we're teaching? And also, as uh, you guys were talking about a moment ago, what have pupils covered previously and where are they going with this in future? Um, so we can make a make a coherent kind of um, learning experience for them. But the thing for me at the moment that is kind of cent central to my thinking is the tasks that we give pupils. I'm less hung up upon how we teach kids, more upon what we get kids to do with what we're trying to teach them. And um, if kids only ever experience routine exercises, then I don't think you're ever going to get more than procedural fluency for them and memorization. Um, we need tasks that are going to help kids to develop conceptual understanding, whether those are matching representations, whether they're considering um, mathematical statements, some of the stuff that Malcolm Swan talks about, for instance. We need other tasks as well, which are going to help to develop kids' dispositions and attitudes towards mathematics to set them up so they can confidently engage in problem solving. So I think a whole, a whole range of tasks there, um, which I think then fall on from the teaching and the teaching I mean, I mean, supports. So it's not so much about how we teach, it's about actually what 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 layer of experiences are we going to get the kids to, to engage in, what activity are we hoping for? Because of the activity is entirely about replication. I'm not going to move towards that deep conceptual landing, but that can tell facts. Um, but we can't tell conceptual understanding. Kid, uh, constructivist at heart, in the sense that kids will construct their own understanding from the experiences they get. So what we need to do then is give them different experiences, successions of experiences over time, um, and which they can then begin to under, you know, which they can then begin to build the, the schema of understanding from. Of course, we'll tell them stuff, but telling alone will not be enough. Um, another thing that's important in this is that this maturation idea. Um, just because we've encountered the idea of integers, we've been working with negative numbers, it, it doesn't mean, even if we're getting 100% in assessments at that point, it doesn't mean that kids have learned that material. And I'm not talking about the difference here between instantaneous performance and learning. I'm talking about even if they can still do all those skills, even if they can problem solve with it, well, understanding is always developing. They're all, they're, that is always going to be expanding. The, the sense of what that is is going to be enhanced. The idea, for instance, when we come to complex numbers or when we come to vectors, all of these things enhance the meaning of what negative is. Um, so we can't say that's it finished. So I don't have a simple answer, but that's just my kind of, I, I'm always like that. It's always nuanced. Um, I don't think I can make you a flow chart that tells you how to do it. Um, there we go. I think that thing Chris is talking about with um, tasks, and I think it's really important the tasks are, that we're asking pupils to work with. It's really important people can talk about differentiation. Differentiation happens very differently in different schools and is viewed differently. You know, are we talking about differentiation by outcome, differentiation by task, differentiation by uh, the teaching and the amount of time? That's which would be the key one for you know those of us that are sort of obsessed with mastery would be the key thing that time is a a real uh important variable and this idea that a unit of learning is a lesson seems a, a rather odd thing to me that in every one hour you do grip something in precisely one hour chunks i i've always found that remarkably odd um I and mean, maybe you do, but maybe it takes you lots of hours or your whole life or five minutes or whatever. Um, and that that is very often missed out in the debate around differentiation, the differentiation by the amount of time allowed. Uh, you know, if you go back to um, when people were starting to formulate uh, 
ideas around mastery. So you go back to personalized systems of instruction, John, John B. Carroll, um, the behaviorists of the 50s and so on. And Bloom, people are talking about, you know, every child can learn well. Every child can learn the things you want them to learn given the right conditions. And one of the conditions in that, oh, well, actually, let's go through some of those right conditions. Uh, one of the right conditions is really good teaching. Right? So that, that's going to matter. Really good teaching is going to matter. Another condition that matters a lot is, well, the child's going to have to try because learning's not easy. So really good teaching and the child trying. And then the other one that's, that's so often missed out is the right amount of time. Uh, I really like that. Uh, I've, I've seen people ask um, I, 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 was, I was at a talk that Robert Bjork was giving uh, ages ago, and uh, he talks about the gap between, you know, how long do you leave this and then maybe you have to return to whatever. And people are always trying to work out a precise amount of time. And his, his response when, when someone said, how long do you leave this? His response was the right amount of time. And I really like that response. You know, How long would it take this child to learn how to add two fractions? However long it takes them to learn to add two fractions the right amount of time. Um, so that's the one, you know, talking about differentiation, I, that's the one thing I'd want to throw in. Uh, Chris has talked about differentiation by task, activity. I'd throw in that time is really important, the amount of time that you allow any individual pupil uh, to grip an idea is, is, is a, something that you can differentiate, something that is very, very personal. If the five of us try to learn something right now, something brand new to the five of us, we'd all grip it in different amounts of time. It wouldn't fit perfectly into it. You know, we wouldn't all make progress in 20 minutes, right? Or whatever the phrase is nowadays. Uh, it'd take however long it takes. So that's what I'll throw in, differentiate by amount of time given. I think some of the processes as well in classrooms are just bizarre. Um, I've sat in classes where the Waltz and the Wilfs went up on the board and it took 15 minutes just to copy those down into the book of the hour. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, differentiation is about, as I mentioned before, about hooking students in. You know, we've been um, we've we've lost Don Stewart very, very sadly, very recently. But some of his resources are just brilliant for pie charts. You're looking at the colours, different colours of Van Gogh's paintings and trying to match the pie chart, of the colours with the painting. Now, that's just, you know, just brilliant. He's He's got pie charts that I've kind of never seen before. They're not about um, who owns what pets in the street. They're about the, the amount of sunlight hours in Reykjavik. Um, and as I say, that you know, his, his tessellations and the tavaleras and relating them to, to mandalas and tavaleras, and it's just inspirational stuff and i think we're we're at a very rich stage now where we can differentiate by task we can differentiate by uh, the hooks as well you know knowing our students in that relationship you know what's likely to interest them what's that likely to grab them um and we we have a wealth of resources out there at the moment that we can do that very effectively with i was just going to add um when we started, I talked about collaborative planning with uh, my department when we started with the mixed attainment. And one of the things that we were very um, keen on was to making sure that everybody could access the work at, you know, at the appropriate cognitive demand for that student. So we spent a lot of time anticipating the responses that those students would make, uh, anticipating any misconceptions and so on and planning appropriate responses for that. So a lot of our differentiation came from the questions that we had planned and the questions that would enable progression for each of the different students. And because we had uh, anticipated responses from different, so we'd imagine ourselves as particular students in the class, anticipate the response they would make and uh, alter our um, responses accordingly and our questions accordingly and, uh, you know, make progression our questions to delve into their understanding of what we were trying to teach them. But also, another thing that we would do for differentiation was to do, um, encourage activities that had lots of um, multiple approaches. I've talked about this earlier today, and having as many approaches as possible so that students can access at their own level. You know, so that they, they call it um, low floor, high ceiling, don't they? So that there's lots of inroads into problems that you can take it as far as you need to and keep going further and further. So the planning is really key for the differentiation. It's planning 
thinking about what problems the students might have and having questions available and trying to think of those on the hoof. A lot of teachers can do, but a lot of teachers can't or haven't got the experience. I mean, I've been teaching 25 years. I've got plenty of experiences of what people might have. If you've been teaching a term, how would you possibly know the 55 different responses that students might give? So I think it's really key, again, training again, uh, a part of the collaborative planning is part of that professional development of thinking of different responses that you're going to give and having those ready uh, for when those uh, situations occur. I think I think something that sometimes uh, we, we focus on a lot as well when we talk about differentiation is people sometimes assume we're talking about the, the lowest detainers in the group. And um, an example, what Mark always talks about this idea of uptime, um, the percentage of time which pupils are engaged in meaningful mathematics learning. Um, and, you know, almost every lesson you see, there's always going to be at least a, one or two kids for whom the work is too hard and also for whom the work is actually too easy. And I think that idea of the, the differentiation in the moment, that, that, that idea of teaching between the desks is quite important too. Um, and an and, and example of this, I recall, I, I recall a pupil who were working on asymptotes, uh, uh, the Scottish equivalent of A-level, and th this kid, very bright boy, and he was able, he could turn it out. Like, there was an exercise of about, about 20 of these questions, and he said, I said, go and do uh, 20, 23, 24, 25, whatever, go and do those last few, and he could do those, and I knew because he could do those ones, I could in theory be able to do the whole thing. And it's saying, well, what do I do with him in that in that moment? Do I just say, well, okay, well, we're not moving on until tomorrow. Do we just sit and go and practice all those other ones? Or do I say, well, go and be mathematical, go and take this a bit further? And I say to him, what do you notice about all these asymptotes? And his reply was, well, they're all lines, they're all straight lines. I said, well, can you can you get an asymptote which isn't a line? And then off he went. And that was him exploring and making conjectures and being mathematical in the moment. Uh, and sure enough, a couple of other kids were so intrigued by what he was doing, they then were kind of racing through to prove to me that they, they could do the work on the linear stuff, so they could go on and start exploring um, these parabolic asymptotes and what have you. Um, and that's just nice in the moment. But as you say, that, that does come with experience, like having, having those little, um, what, what my friend Tom Carson, what he calls available actions in the moment, have, having that... Um, have been sensitised to see those opportunities and to take them, that, that, I don't think that comes quickly at all in your career. I think that, that is something that's hard. Can I just add, I think people are helped there um, enormously nowadays with um, the wealth of um, professional development books um, that are out there for Craig Barton, for example, Joan Morgan, Pete Mattock, um, obviously Mark, um, you know, there's some fantastic personal development, uh, professional development books um, that develop your own love of your subject and help you make all these connections as well. So thank you, that's all. Um, so, you know, you've, you've got a wealth of, of materials out there. It's just knowing about them and obviously on Twitter as well. I think the maths educators have owned it really. Um, and it is about developing your own love of the subject, which enables you then to sort of develop these um, these skills and uh, practical ability to do that and to be flexible enough in the classroom uh, to react and, and ask those clever questions. But I think you're right, Matilda, about that predetermination. Think of 10 clever questions before you go into the classroom based on, based on uh, the topic that you're kind of um, looking at uh, and trying to make those other connections and they're all bringing it back to, to the basics of um, bid mass principles. <laughs> <laughs> there is something about the um, attitudes that we create in mathematics, mathematics classrooms as well, that uh, all across the Northwestern cultures, there is an attitude in mathematics classrooms that what you do is you get, you have a problem and you solve it and then there's an answer and that that answer is the end. And I'm not sure that is a mathematics classroom. That, and I'm not sure that's what mathematicians do at all. Mathematicians are just curious. They have scenarios and they're curious about them. So they ask questions about those scenarios and they ask more questions and they follow lines of inquiry and they go down dead ends and they come back up and they attack it. And you know, it's that thing you were talking about a minute ago, Chris, with the kid with the asymptotes. Maybe if we'd inculcated 
an attitude from primary onwards that this classroom, when you're in mathematics, part of it is, yeah, sure, you're going you're gonna to solve some stuff, and that's interesting, but part of it is, maybe the biggest part of it, is this lesson thing, this thing called mathematics. This is the lesson where the thing we want you to play with the most is your curiosity. That we want you to be curious about everything that comes up and ask questions and explore why these things happen. And, and then you might create a, a classroom then where uh, the, the tasks that you, you're talking about, I mean, that go to the sort of low floor, high ceiling tasks. You, we might create a classroom there where we could just set one of those and off they go, right? They just, they just go for it. And they go for all different levels, which helps with the, 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 the operating at different attainment levels. They all, they all go from different directions, different things. Now, of course, what we do in the classroom is when we're designing tasks, even though the children in front of us think this is the first time any human being has ever thought this about this task. This was my idea, my line of inquiry. I'm the first person to have ever taken this task this way. And as teachers, we pretend that it is, right? We, well, oh my God, I never thought of that. Isn't that amazing you've done that? But we design tasks and we can manipulate the design of tasks such that actually they'll be curious about the things we want them to be curious about. They'll ask the questions we want them to ask. They'll follow the lines of inquiry that we know they're going to follow. And there's something about task design. That's why task design is so hard. There's something about task design that can do that, that you can you can make pupils follow these lines of inquiry. Um, you know, that's why designing a, sim a single question, an incredibly hard thing to do, or a single problem to work on is a really hard thing to do. But that, that thing of an attitude of curiosity, rather than an attitude of, this is the lesson. Like if you ask children, what's the, what's the art lesson about? What's the music lesson about? What's the sport lesson about? What's the literature lesson about? And, and ask them those questions and hear how they talk about those things. It's very, very different to what's the, maths what's the maths lesson about. The maths lesson they all say is about getting questions right or wrong, which is really weird because that isn't what mathematicians do. So I think there's something we can do there and then that helps with the whole differentiation thing because they then have never ending problems. As soon as you get to a point where they think, the bit where I get an answer is the end in mathematics. Once you get to that kind of place, differentiation becomes really bloody hard because you think, oh God, all these tasks are going to end. They're all going to end at different points for different people. I've got to come up with lots and lots and lots of different things for them to do. Whereas you could just say, so my favorite lesson, right? and people will hate me for this, um, but I, I, don't, I don't really care. Uh, my favorite lesson I used to teach year nine was to make a trebuchet, right? you know, a throwing arm, an ancient throwing arm. And they used to make these little trebuchets. They're usually about a foot high. And at the end of the lesson, uh, and the lesson was however long it took, right? At the end of making these trebuchets, we would have a war. And the trebuchets were real, so they could throw grapes. And then the room, we used to have a war. Now, the differentiation by outcome was the people that did it really well won. <laughs> they won the war. So, and that, that sort of thing of, it was a never ending thing. There was always more and more and more and more and more they could ask about that problem. I think there's, I don't know, a lot of maths classrooms have lost curiosity as a central theme for what it is a maths education is about. So I'd throw that in as well, a curiosity sense. Mark, do you think that that's actually going to something? To that, Mark. On you go. No, you go. You sure? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll be very, very quick. Yeah, I, 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 you, you kind of hint at that, that important idea of teachers do mathematics for themselves because how can you instill uh, what mathematics is to pupils unless you do mathematics yourself? John Mason said to me that um, it, like if you were going to hire a music teacher, you would expect them to like play music. If you were going to, if you're going to hire an art teacher, you would expect them to actually dabble in some art. If you're going to get a maths teacher, you should probably get um, someone who dabbles in a bit of maths. And it doesn't need to be the most high-level stuff. Just dabble and play and inquire yourself. I think that's why some of the stuff that the ATM do, uh, like the Thursday night being mathematical, you put up a, as a train goes past, you put up a, uh, a little mathematical phenomena. But usually it's something 
upper primary, if that, and people just see what they get out of it. And it's amazing the depth of ma mathematics that people are able to kind of take from that. Um, and I think by, by doing that, you're kind of giving yourself an awareness of where tasks can go, and you can then build that in your kids. Sorry, Mathilde. No, you can apologise. <laughs> um, I was going to say, um, one of our mantras, and I can't remember where I heard it first, when we first started the mixed team, was uh, the answer is just the beginning. And that's something that we uh, had in all of our classrooms on the wall. The answer is just the beginning. To stop those children saying the answer is 12. Um, one of the, one of the um, things I was going to say was about um, to make sure that we get them constant when they are in these lessons where they're all doing this, there's a massive buzz and they're all doing their own bit of maths and it's the most wonderful thing in the world when your classes are like that. To keep a control of making sure that they're on the right track uh, for, for where you want for the most interesting maths that they're going to see is um, choosing which examples you want to share. Like you said, Mark, they think it's the first time anybody's come up with that, this idea, but we know all the different ones that come up. Every now and then, some people do surprises. I have been surprised quite a few times. But choosing which examples to share, so that when you're going around the classroom and they're working on their mini whiteboards, which mini whiteboards are you going to pick up and share with the class? Uh, which ones uh, were you hoping to see, but actually they don't come up with? And how are you going to bring those in? Because sometimes they all go off on their things, but the most interesting case that you think is really going to get them curious doesn't actually come up naturally. So how do you bring that in? Then actually you could have, well, in my other class, this is one of their examples that they came in as well. So trying to get um, as many different viewpoints as possible, but the ones that are the most interesting. Um, that's quite a difficult thing to do. And how do you share them? You know, if you're not working on mini whiteboards, I think the use of the visualizer is really useful there. And actually stopping students as well. So not just letting them go off, but every now and then having an intervention where you stop and say, right, everybody, I want you to have a look at this one here. How does that compare to yours? And how does that compare to what you're doing? Is it going to help you? Can you build on this? Can you improve this? Can you... Um, combine that with yours to make a, a super solution or a super uh, more efficient way of answering it. Uh, which of these do you think is the best? Uh, which of these do you think I will like the best and why? Because they know that you've got your own particular favourite ways of doing things and they know that the sorts of things that you personally like and it's different to what another teacher might like. What sort, which answer do you, th which solution do you think this other teacher will like because you know them as well? And asking them to critique the things that they're doing and to stop them and think about what they're doing, reminding them of what the focus of the lessons are. So constantly reminding, what are we trying to achieve here? Is what you're doing, are you going to get towards that? Um, do you want to reconsider your approach in the light of everything else that you've seen here? Uh, do you want to improve the way you've done it? Listening to everybody else's solution, can we all go away now and refine what we're doing? So those sorts of things get people excited. They're building on each other's work. You know, there's a bit of an agency there of them having some kind of uh, authority over what they're doing and some ownership of the work that they're doing. And I think that um, develops a lot of creativity and a lot of uh, awe and wonder in the work that they're doing. And I also add in there about the challenge, is that constant challenge as well. If, if a student on a whiteboard has put something like 2D, 2D um, shape down, you know, is that challenge? What's, what do you mean by 2D, two dimensions? What's a dimension? You know, very diff, it's quite um, encouraging to develop communication mathematically is is about articulating it first. And a lot of students, the chief examiner's reports tell us that, that to be able to write uh, a coherent sentence explaining why something is because it is, uh, the starting points with that have to be that conversation. So you put 2D, what's a D? It's a dimension, what's a dimension? And then, oh, okay, uh, you've put 9 a.m. What does what does a.m. mean? What does p.m. mean? And then they, you know, they start to guess. Um, so it re really is that challenge and that minutiae of detail as well um, that kind of um, should infiltrate through that. I think that the pupil articulation is so important. Um, one of my favorite things is just five whys. I, I've always found that children can respond to what questions too easily. So whenever they say something to me, so blah, 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 I say, why? And they go, blah, blah, blah. I say, why? <laughs> if, you do, if you ask a child, 
just why five times watch what happens to them i mean they go crazy right it, it drives them absolutely nuts but it forces them to think and think and think properly because everyone no matter who you are most people give surface level uh responses they, they give quick responses to things and if you keep asking why and why and why that, that takes you somewhere else in an interesting way it's it's when you were talking a minute ago tilly about um sometimes the responses they give surprise you right so most of them we have up our sleeve don't we we really we know what they're going to say the number of times i've had to pretend to be amazed at the child who shows me a specific pattern with some quiz and error rods right and i always camp it up and say oh my god it's amazing first time i've ever seen it and they think it's wonderful um but we we generally know what they are but yeah occasionally new things come along and and it's the first time you've ever heard a pupil say it it's the first time that's happened in that particular way it could be a positive thing could be a misconception as well the first time you've ever seen that misconception the first time you've ever seen that excellent response um i remember when i, when I started teaching um the, the, the department I was in had lots of very, very detailed plans and topics and so on. Um, but one thing that was said to me by my, my mentor is that, you know, as you go through your career, you'll uh, notice more and more different things they say in this lesson. You'll notice more and more misconceptions or you'll notice more and more responses and so on. I remember saying at the time, well, have you not written it down? <laughs> like, why do I have to go through a whole career? until i know what those things are why haven't you written them down to share with me and, and i i've always found that thing of institutional knowledge um not being maintained in teaching that's rather odd and it, it would be wonderful like in my say i'm in the classroom and you're in the classroom telling them we're teaching the same lesson wouldn't it be wonderful if a weird thing happened to me a weird thing happened to you and we added it to the same knowledge base the same place somewhere and that knowledge base could be revealed to our trainee teachers or revealed to anyone that's teaching maths and so on. I've always thought that would be a, a, a really useful thing to do. And I'm, I'm surprised it, it doesn't exist. Um, some of the stuff that uh, places like Shell Center used to, when, when you got things like the red box, the, red, the best thing about red and blue box is that at the end of it, there are, there are really detailed notes on real lessons that happened and real pupil responses and so on. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading those before delivering, like I'm going to deliver the one about alcohol level in the blood, read through the scripts of things that happened to real children so that I could role play in my head. This is how this is going to pan out. So I better make this decision here or this decision here and change, change what I'm doing. Now. So I thought, I think that's a really an, an interesting thing that these new things come up, but, I don't think they should be new wherever possible they shouldn't be new if we had a, a way of collecting the knowledge of the profession so that it was shared would be useful and um and i'll just very quickly about what chris was talking about um with, with people doing maths you know I, i've said loads and loads of times yeah the art teacher has a exhibition in the local library the drama teacher does amdram the sports teacher plays on five or size the english <coughs> teacher is a usually a failed novelist um but they all recreationally do their subject. And I think it's, it's really unfortunate that so many people who teach mathematics don't recreationally do maths. But I did just want to pull you up on one thing there, Chris, about what you were saying about how, you know, how this, this might be um, improved. I, I think that one of the reasons that lots of people don't recreationally do mathematics is because of how mathematics has been communicated to them as some kind of um, impenetrable domain of people who are quite sort of, you know, high up here and you know, off in their own world and separate. Whereas if we, if we maybe propose mathematics as just being genuinely curious about things, just being genuinely curious about anything that comes up and asking questions about it and being willing to enjoy being stuck and being willing to attack things from all different angles, then maybe more and more people would get involved in it. And I wonder if one of the things that's happened over the years is that quite a lot of people have presented mathematics as though it's a, a secret and exclusive club to belong to rather than it's just something everyone can do. So I like it when John says dabble. Dabble's a good word, right? Um, 
do you consider yourself an artist no not really but i like to i like to sketch oh right so you're an artist then aren't you oh yeah i am actually do you consider yourself a mathematician no do you enjoy problems and getting under the skin of them oh yeah oh so you're a mathematician then and you know that that idea of it not being some exclusive elite secret club i think would be helpful uh anyway i digress Talking about the um, banks of things where, you know, misconceptions and uh, possible solutions that people have. And um, I'm part of a group called Collaborative Lesson Research, um, which I probably should have said in the introduction, actually. Follow them on Twitter, Collaborative Lesson Research, if, uh, if you want to. Um, and it's uh, based on authentic um, Japanese lessons to be. Um, but one of the key parts of um, the lesson research is your planning for your lesson. Uh, which they call Kyozai Kyenkyu in uh, Japan, which is the part of the, the research where you investigate all previous ways of teaching it and all previous things that could come up as well. And in Japan, they have banks of these things. They have everything there. And also in other jurisdictions, they have all that there. So that's something we can build up over time, isn't it? It is something that we can do. Uh, it's when you do collaboratively plan you can do it within your own institutions but it is such a shame that um we struggle to do that in this country uh, we're putting together a package on kozai kenku at the moment and one of the problems is the availability of uh, such pieces of work and hopefully that will be something that we can develop over time and um, talking about doing maths as well uh yourself one of my fa favorite memories actually is that when we do maths challenge at school and joining all the maths teachers joining in with the children doing the maths challenges and all the children being quite surprised that you're actually enjoying the plus doing the puzzles alongside with them I remember going on a ski trip one year with them and it was just after the maths challenge we just took a whole load of them for the 24-hour bus journey and gave them out and we all had competitions about who could do it the quickest uh, ours was called the geek bus we had two buses that were going along and uh, having this pride about being a big maths geek, in. it's something that I've always enjoyed doing, but to build up the uh, people being proud of being mathematicians rather than something to be embarrassed about or ashamed of, which is what some of the children feel, I think. Very good. Um, yeah, I'll just take another question from the floor on the Twitter. Um, it's linked to where we are. Uh, perhaps for Mark or Chris, it's based on mastery. Uh, Mr. Canning, part of the mastery cycle is the use of correctives. Could this be discussed in more detail, please? For example, if a pupil struggles to rationalise the denominator, should you teach another method or explain the same method in a different way? Oh, bloody hell. Um, rationalise the denominator is really the example they chose. <laughs> Okay, uh, that's a fun one. Um, so in a nutshell, correctives are just responsive teaching, responding to the pupils in front of you, what's going on when you're trying to communicate an idea that they grip the idea. Um, we know, we know as educators, we also know from research that when people are trying to learn something novel, something brand new, they take different amounts of time and they grip meaning from different models, metaphors, examples. Uh, explanations, uh, you know, instruction. So suppose um, you have 30 children in front of you and you use one example to teach rationalizing the denominator. In a room, let's suppose you're pretty good at it as well and the example is clear and they're working at the right level for them. Um, in a room, a bunch of the pupils will grip that idea because they will make meaning from the example and the way in which you explained it. But in a typical room, a bunch of pupils won't grip the idea either. And it's incumbent upon the teacher to react to that, use a different way of explaining it, a subtly different explanation or a different model or a different representation. So still explaining the same concept but in a different way um, would be a very quick response. Um, and that's for people where rationalizing the denominator is really the thing they ought to be learning today. Uh, other type of corrective might well be that you're trying to teach 30 pupils how to rationalize the denominator and a bunch of them got it and a bunch of them didn't get it and you work out that actually one of these pupils no matter which way that you try to explain rationalizing the denominator they don't grip it and that's probably because the mathematics you're presenting to them at that time the mathematics you're trying to communicate to them isn't right for their maturation isn't right for the developmental level 
Um, so then that's a case of knowing the stream back, the kind of journey back through the map that Julia was talking about earlier on to work out where is this pupil uh, solid in their, in their understanding of the ideas. Rationalizing the denominator contains a heck of a lot of ideas. You know, that one single little thing, uh, there's a lot of mathematics in that and a lot of things that could be wrong in doing that. Um, and then it's being forensic about working out which bit of it is is tripping them up. Or maybe it's a couple of bits tripping them up, working your way back and reacting to it. So correctives is just a, it's a, a chap called Morrison who came up with this term in 1920s. It's just a, a label for saying good teaching, right? React, react to the people in front of you. Have they gripped the idea yet? If they haven't gripped this idea, why on earth would you move on? Let's, let's respond to them. Let's get that sorted out and make sure that we are able to move on uh, to the next thing. Um, it's lovely to see jurisdictions around the world where correctives are worked into the academic day. So you, you will have pupils who some of the misconceptions so they have literally misconceived uh, something you're trying to tell them, trying to communicate with them. On that same day, you then have dedicated time to react with them and dedicated time to do these correctives. Um, it's great watching when you, when you watch really, really impressive expert teachers, watching them react in live time in the classroom. It's, it's such a wonderful thing to see teachers do because they know the tiny little tweaks that are required, like watching a, a like watch, watching a, a really good personal tutor and they're listening and they're observing and they're watching what the pupil's doing and reacting in the moment live to that pupil. So correctives can be live and they can also be shortly afterwards. The important thing about correctives is they happen before moving on to something that depends on understanding that thing. So if you have identified a pupil has not gripped this idea, why on earth would you move on to another idea that fundamentally relies on gripping that idea? So correctives mm -hmm. must happen before that. So hopefully yeah. that's a, a very yeah, quick I, summary of what they are. I, I do that in my personal tutoring, which is to uh, exactly going back to the idea of that student articulation i will and then ask them what do you think it is and then keep digging into i mean i use the software analogy of debugging so you know i'll kind of try and figure out which level the problem's at and what for rationalizing the denominator it could be a mixed one with a third or not but you know it is there's a lot lot in it so and then until i find out where exactly the problem is then sort of uh in a very surgical way look at it and uh, help them out. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any other questions, Asma? Yeah. Um, yeah. We can kind of start uh, wrapping up, but we we still have quite a few questions actually. Uh, let's go with um, Lee Overy. How do you think a percentage of a number should be written? Do as to not communicate a misconception. E.g., could fifteen percent equals pound twenty? create a misconception okay i had a look at this when this one came in um and to my mind i mean i, I do see a lot of um older older students um, adults post 16 etc who really struggle with the, the concept of percentages um fractions as well but i think it's because in a lot of instances they don't see them as equivalences so one of um, my kind of approaches is always that a fraction equals a percentage equals a uh, a decimal. They're, they're all different representations of the same thing and leading to a fluency in those. I mean, 15%, 15 over 100, I see that as three twentieths, one twentieth of, of, of 20 is an easier calculation uh, to work with. So um, when you think of, of a particular question such as 12.5% of 80, well, our normal build-up method is 10%, 1%, double it, half a percent. You've got five steps there, but if you recognise that 12.5% is an eighth, sometimes it's the way we view these things. One eighth of 80 is a lot easier to calculate um, than 12.5%. Um, 
and, and then and then you get into all the misconceptions of of working with a calculator and the multiplier uh, which is the decimal equivalent of the the percentages so i think for me a decimal is a percentage is a fraction is my first point um, and i always try and teach and reinforce and get them to the the point where they practice it till not till they can get it right but they practice it so much until they cannot get it wrong uh, and then they've got this toolbox of, of things that they can pick from if they know that 15 percent of something is 20 or 15 15 percent of a, of, a, of a number equals 20 pounds they can see that 15 percent as well, maybe it's 15 over 100 maybe that's simplified maybe it's times by 0.15 um they get to the point where they're so fluent with it that it doesn't then become a, a, a separate separate entity as a percentage or a fraction or as a decimal they're all the same thing um, i'll just chip in on percentage misconceptions uh, they generally stem from early level mathematics and the way in which fractions are taught um, and the confusion between fractions and unit fractions um, which happens a lot you know so a lot of pupils very very early on are told that one half say is 0 0.5 and of course one half is not 0 0.5 is it and a lot of people get stuck with that. They get stuck with thinking one half is 0 0.5 or one quarter is 0 0.25. And that's not true. One half of one is 0 0.5. One half of one quarter of one is 0 0.25. But that is the only time. Uh, and that confuses pupils when they move on to a question like one quarter of 20. Because they wonder, where's the 0 0.25? So a quarter is 0 0.25. And where is it? Um, so that that thing of unit, the difference between fraction and simple fra uh, simple fraction and unit fraction in early maths is really important. So fifteen percent long before that, let's talk about hundreds. Fifteen out of one hundred equal parts of. Then what's the unit? We need to always be talking about what's the unit. Fifteen out of one hundred equal parts of fifty. Fifteen out of one hundred equal parts of two. Fifteen out of one hundred equal parts of one. 15 out of 100 equal parts of 100, whatever it is, but there always has to be a unit to it. There has to be a thing that we're referring to um, so that by the time we get to talking about percentages, it's a shorthand way of saying out of 100 equal parts of. Um, that, that, a lot of the, the misconception around percentages stems from that, uh, not introducing them as, as unit not not introducing unit fractions correctly and not introducing out of 100 equal parts of a thing that's also why pupils get confused that percentages can go above 100 and they, they think it ends at 100. Uh, anyway it's quite a technical response yeah we discussed that last week as well where they think it ends at 100 or the whole and then there is something beyond the whole um, um, yeah, anyone else on that one? Uh, I'm guessing the, the, the summer heat <laughs> is uh, tiring us all out. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it kind of wraps us up uh, very nicely. There's still a few questions um, on Twitter, but uh, we'll try and address them on the next one because the great thing about this hashtag is uh, the questions remain there on the hashtag. We're trying to cover as much as uh, of them as possible. Uh, yeah, we're aiming to do these uh, every Thursday, and um, if your questions are there, we'll we'll tackle them at some point or the other. Um, and you can also, of course, just ask on Twitter as well. So, uh, so once again, uh, yes, thanks for very much for for your time. I know it's a it's a hot day out there, and you've taken it out. Um, and uh, you know we've had a, quite a long innings. I don't know, Chris, uh, you're in sunny Scotland there. You've had to go out and manage a manage a connection there. So, um, is that the one day it's coming out this year, Chris? Just the one sunny day. <laughs> oh, you're muted, mate. Today, today is summer, yeah. Um, <laughs> those uh, Reykjavik temperature graphs that Don Stewart had on nothing on Glasgow, I tell you. <laughs> Brilliant. So uh, I'll stop streaming now. So thank you for everyone who's engaged and um, for your time. And um, yeah, we hope to be back uh, same time uh, next week. I'll, uh, this recording will be there on Twitter so you can engage with it. It'll be on my YouTube channel as well. So, uh, thank you very much. I'll stop streaming now and we'll have a chat the rest of